first good afternoon to the rest of our country. We're good morning to you all. Before we get into it, though, we're going to go over some quick housekeeping. Uh, again, this webinar is going to be worth one ISA CEU. If you did not enter your ISA certification number during the registration process, then you can go over to the GoToMeeting uh, dialog box there, expand that box out. There should be a little arrow someplace over in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Find your way down to the questions field. If there is a plus sign there, click on that plus sign and that will expand the field and you can put your ISA CEU number or ISA certification number um, there now and we'll make sure that you get that, that CEU for attending this today. Um, and again, at any time during the webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to type into that field right there and uh, we'll make sure to get those questions answered at the end of the webinar. Or, you know, if we need to do any follow-up with you, that's how we'll, we'll find a way to follow up with you. And this webinar is being recorded. Uh, after the webinar today, you will get an email um, with a link to the recording. And it also can be found on our website at treecarescience.com um, under the Education tab. So real quick, who is this person talking through your computer today? Well, my name is Patrick Anderson. Uh, I am an arborologist here at Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. My job is to work with our our external staff, our internal staff, and our clients on product and protocol support. So at any time, you can feel free to give me a call with questions on, uh, again, rainbow products, diagnostics, and protocols. Um, you can also please feel free to visit our website at treecarescience.com to find much more information, again, on our products and diagnostics and protocols. And also feel free to call into that solution center number uh, right there, where, again, if you have any questions on our diagnostics, protocol support, things like that, you will actually talk to a live human being who will be able to get answers uh, for you that day. And real quick, too, to talk about, uh, just to put in perspective why um, we're sitting here today uh, going through some training, um, Rainbow was born actually out of a, a um, tree service company that got its start by doing Dutch elm disease injections um, in the 70s. And we did such a good job with that service that our clients started asking for more services. And in the mid 80s, Rainbow Tree Care was born. This is a full care tree service provider here in the Twin Cities area of um, Minnesota. Um, from there, Rainbow Scientific was born in 1998. And what we do, what we strive to do, is to bring research, product support, and diagnostic support to you, landscape managers and arborists out there in the field, and really be kind of the, the, the branch of, of people that you can reach out to and get support from. And that is why we're here today. Um, we have a full research and development team, and we predict, participate in many um, research um, trials to develop protocols that many arborists are using today, including the oak wilt management protocol, as well as developing rates for imidacloprid to protect against ash trees. So one thing I like to tell people is every time you purchase something from Rainbow, part of that goes directly back into the research and de development um, for our industry. So right back into tree care, arboricultural development, as well as landscape management protocols that we can use um, in the field and bring to you all. So with that, again, today we're going to be talking about chlorosis and chlorosis management. So our intended outcomes for this morning or this afternoon um, is to actually address what is chlorosis, what are the causes of chlorosis, why are trees susceptible to chlorosis, and then finally treatment strategies for managing the different types of chlorosis that we run into. So real quick, let's get to the meat of it. What is chlorosis? Well, chlorosis is simply a condition where a tree cannot properly manufacture chlorophyll. And this results in a yellow tree that is struggling to thrive and can be the onset of a spiral of decline where the tree is going to be susceptible to many other factors um, in its general decline in vitality and health. Um, diagnosing the problem of chlorosis on the outset is very easy because, again, Chlorosis is simply the tree not being able to produce enough chlorophyll for itself. Chlorophyll is the reason why we have green leaves. So if the tree doesn't have enough chlorophyll because it can't produce it for itself, then we're going to have a yellow appearance. 
So again, from a sales standpoint to our to your clients, to the consumer, this is a very easy uh, condition to point out because it's very, very visual. Um, it's something that we can really, really show our clients from the outset. In many cases, it is the, maybe the reason why we're out there on that property to begin with. Why is my tree sick? Uh, it's probably something we hear very often when we start seeing things like this. So these examples of chlorosis. Uh, here we have our intervenal chlorosis, uh, general chlorosis of the leaves, standing back and looking at the tree, a yellow tree. Here's an interesting one where we have a, a very nice looking tree next to a, a chlorotic tree. So this is what chlorosis looks like. This is how it manifests itself in the tree. Now, what is the cause of chlorosis is really, you know, the meat of the issue. So, you know, we can make a lot of assumptions based upon what a tree looks like, but Chlorosis can be a combination of factors that manifest itself in the tree where the tree can't produce enough chlorophyll. And those uh, factors can be things like insects and disease issues. Um, many times it's the soil is deficient in one of our um, elemental nutrients. Uh, we have issues with soil chemistry as a whole. Um, in many parts of our country, we have very um, high pH soils which tie up micronutrients, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. Um, and then, of course, you know, a lot of these resources that the tree needs to produce chlorophyll for itself come from the soil. And if we have poorly developed or damaged root systems, then once again, we can't take advantage of those resources, pull them up into the tree, and um, get that, that resource for itself. So this, again, ties into our methods of plant health care or our appropriate response process, where we can't simply just take a, a generalized high-value look of a tree and then make assumptions based upon just that quick look. This is really about getting in there, you know, asking questions, monitoring the situation, making the correct diagnosis, and then that is going to lead to how we're going to manage the overall situation. So again, chlorosis can be caused by many different factors. And one common factor, of course, is by arthropod pests. So we have many common issues there throughout our country, such as aphids, as we can see here on the left-hand side of our screen, which they're actually feeding within the vascular system of the tree and just robbing the tree of nutrients um, that it needs to produce carbohydrates and sugars. Uh, we have a situation here on our right with spider mites, which again, when we stand back, this might definitely appear as a yellowing chlorosis of the tree um, might easily be misdiagnosed as something else, but once we actually get up and take a closer look, we see we actually have mites damage actually feeding within the cells of the tree. We have some diseases that might also mimic um, chlorotic systems, or cause chlorotic symptoms, rather. Uh, in our example here on the left, we have things like oak wilt, which are prevalent in many parts of our country, where we're actually getting an intervenal or a venal necrosis in this um, situation, but again, if we stand back and if we don't dig into the problem, we might easily misdiagnose this as possibly a nutrient deficiency, where in fact it is a quite um, important uh, disease of, of oaks and could actually lead to their death uh, very quickly in some cases. On the right, we have Dutch elm disease, which again, the, the early signs or symptoms rather of Dutch elm disease appear as yellow flagging within the tree. Uh, and of course, we know that Dutch elm disease can be um, quite a, a terrible disease and kill elms if misdiagnosed. Um, we have some other pathogens as well. We have a whole host of foliar leaf diseases where, again, will begin as a yellow halo or a yellowing on the leaf, which, again, this is a foliar disease that we need to treat uh, differently than any of the other diseases we've spoken to about already, and also we would need to treat differently compared to a nutrient deficiency. Um, we have another bacterial disease, bacterial leaf scorch, which, again, creates this kind of yellowing-looking condition, this yellow halo around the, the leaf there and can be easily misdiagnosed as, as a, a, another kind of deficiency symptom. Um, we have chlorosis that are caused by some of these other factors, as I like to call them, some of these uh, potential uh, site factors, where in the case of too much water. So we know that our roots, again, they need air to respire. And if we fill up those macro pore spaces where those roots are residing, and we take the ability uh, away from them to get oxygen, then we're going to have root damage. And again, that root damage is going to correlate to symptoms in the crown, which could correlate to, again, this yellowing condition. 
Um, we have drought conditions as are examples of these leaves here on the right, where we simply are just not getting enough water into the tree. Water plays a very important role in both getting nutrients up into the leaves as well as creating chlorophyll within the leaf. So if we have a lack of water, then we're gonna get these, these symptoms in the tree, which again, these need to be diagnosed. If we came in and we fertilized a tree that wasn't getting enough water, we really wouldn't be doing a very good service to the tree or to our client. We would not get the results that we had hoped for. And then we also have some of these other root damaging um, issues when it comes to, to the root development and chlorosis within a tree. So again, as I mentioned, you know, trees are getting uh, many of the nutrients and water that they need to produce chlorophyll for themselves from the soil. And again, roots play a major role in harvesting those resources. So if we do something like the issue, the picture here on the left, where we are simply damaging the root zone of the tree, then of course we're not going to have enough roots. We're not going to be able to get those resources from the soil, and that's going to result in a lack of chlorophyll in the leaf, which will then correspond to chlorotic conditions. Here on the right, we have a tree, and this might be an extreme case in some uh, issues, in some cases here. We have a tree on the right that simply does not have enough soil volume. You know, if you look into how to get happy, healthy trees, you will read that they, a happy, healthy tree has a lot of healthy soil volume. And in this case, we don't have hardly enough soil volume. We have here a tree that probably wants to get to be about 70 feet tall. Um, planted in a very restricted root zone, which again, if we don't have the resources in our soil, then we are not going to get those elements up into the tree, and we're going to have a chlorotic-looking sick tree. So these are examples of some of the site issues that we deal with, um, where we really need to dig into the, the protocol, and we'll talk about those here in a little bit. But in many, many situations, as we know, and as we've all probably run into here in the past, is chlorosis is may be called by a nutrient deficiency. And this is a very, of course, common uh, cause of chlorosis. Now, if you look at the amount of nutrients a tree needs, we have about 17 essential plant nutrients. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, um, we pull those from the air, and of course, uh, water we get from our soil. But if we look at now what we consider um, our other, our primary nutrients, our secondary nutrients, and micronutrients, all of these nutrients we are getting from the soil. So here we have primary nutrients, which are, again, our N, P, and K, which we most commonly find as a soil or a, a fertilizer analysis in most of our, our common fertilizers. Now, they call these primary nutrients because the tree uses them in relatively large amounts, and they are most often found as being, one of these three are most often found as being deficient within the soil. And this is why we see those NPK fertilizers used so widely and why they have such great effects when we apply them to trees uh, because the tree wants to use a lot of these nutrients and again one of them is usually commonly lacking within our soils. Now we have down here what we call our secondary nutrients. Now our secondary nutrients are used in large amounts but they're commonly available in our soils. Now again keep in mind I'm speaking in generalities here. Every site uh, every area of the country is a little bit different, so you know these might not always hold true for your site and your area. But again, these are in general. This is why we we get these names and the way we think of these these elements here. And now finally, we have our micronutrients. Now micronutrients are used in small amounts compared to our other nutrients within the tree. But that being said, they are still very important. And if we, even though the tree might not use as much iron as, say, phosphorus, if we have an iron deficiency, then we will definitely get uh, a chlorotic look within the tree. So if we take another high-level look at what these nutrients are used for, you can see where we have some of these going into vegetation shoot growth, uh, fruit and seed production. But if we Go over here to chlorophyll and photosynthesis, which again, chlorophyll is going to give us that green content to our leaf. We have, again, from a high level, a lot of different nutrients, both macro and micronutrients, that the tree is going to need to go through this process of creating chlorophyll for itself. So again, it doesn't matter how much of these other nutrients we have, if we have just one nutrient that is not going to be available to the plant for whatever reason, we are still going to get this 
this chlorotic looking condition. And in this case here, you know, we use the, the barrel example. We have plenty of our other 17 nutrients, but we are lacking in potassium. And because of that lack of potassium, we are still getting this chlorotic condition. So it doesn't matter how much nitrogen we made available to this plant, doesn't matter how much um, iron we made available to this plant, we would still be getting chlorotic conditions because we simply just don't have enough potassium in this particular case. And that's true of all of our um, nutrients. Um, if we don't have them available, we're going to have uh, symptoms showing up within the plant. Now, of these 17 different nutrients, um, some of which we can collect from the air, but most of which we collect from the soil, we have what we call both mobile nutrients and immobile nutrients. Now, mobile nutrients um, are able to be reallocated within the plant itself. So if we have a deficiency in some of our mobile nutrients, it'll show up in the older leaves because the plant will reallocate those, those nutrients into the newer leaves. And these are examples of, of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, where if we start to see symptoms in older leaves versus newer leaves, we know we have a mobile nutrient issue. Now this is different than immobile nutrients. Immobile nutrients, they, just, they don't move as easily within the plant. So we will get deficiency symptoms um, in our newer growth. So again, in our example here, our, our older growth is nice and dark and looks great, but all of our newer growth, this is where our, our nutrient deficiencies are showing up. And this is most common in some of those micronutrients that we, we talked about. So not necessarily the nutrients that the plant is going to use a lot of, but still become very, very important. And again, if we look at some very common examples of micronutrient deficiencies within trees. This is where we get our endovranal chlorosis on, on newer leaves, and it is very commonly one of these uh, nutrients you see here, either iron, manganese, um, are some of our really common ones, uh, magnesium, and of course many other of our immobile nutrients, but these are the ones that seem to come up the most. And now this has to ties in also with our pH available, um, um, our pH of the soil and how that affects element availability. So pH is the measurement of hydrogen ions in the soil. And if we have a low pH, then we have what we call an acidic soil. If we have a high pH, we have what we call a, a basic soil. So if we see here on this chart, our pH affects the availability of our nutrients. And we can see we have a sweet spot here that's about 6.2 to 7.3, depending upon, again, the plant, the site, and the nutrient. But when we get into these higher pHs, and again, we're only talking about slightly higher pHs here, you can see when we come down to our micronutrients, they suddenly start becoming less available. And this is where pH can play a big role in the overall look of the plant because it doesn't matter how much iron we have in the soil at this point, that iron is being held up because of the soil pH. So if we take a look at some trees that become common, commonly chlorotic due to immobile nutrients, uh, again, our, in many cases are iron and manganese, we have things like pin oaks, which are very common in many of our service areas, river birches, which are becoming more and more popular throughout the country, red maples, which we all know are very popular no matter where you are, um, silver maple and, and sweet gum. So these are some of these trees where we, if we start to see newer growth that is looking chlorotic and unhealthy, we're getting told, we're, we're starting to, to whittle down what some of our issues might be here and we're beginning to think maybe this is a micronutrient issue here. And again, this is where we talked about that appropriate response process, where we need to go through, we need to really ask what our site history is, what's been going on out there, how long has this house been here, what happened here last year, how long has that pool been here, you know, what kind of, what can we have going on here on the site. Um, we need to see, all right, is it a pest or disease issue? Is it, you know, again, we have maybe a, a, a red maple that's beginning to look chlorotic, so we're starting to think, oh, it might have an iron deficiency, but we get up to it, and here it come to find out it has red maple spider mite. Um, we need to, if we do start whittling it down to the point where we think it's a nutrient issue, then we really need to figure out what nutrient is missing in that plant. 
So this is where we need to take soil samples and tissue samples because not only do we want to know what is in the soil, but we want to know is that plant getting enough of that nutrient. So again, you know, let's use our example of pH. We know that in high pH soils that iron may become unavailable. Now, we've done some research here, and specifically Dr. Don Marks has shown some research that, that shows that the rhizosphere can actually influence pH. So, you know, again, in some cases where we have one tree that's looking a little chlorotic um, compared to another tree of the same species, maybe on the same site that's not, you know, what's going on there? Well, if the root system can influence the pH of the soil around it, then do we have a root development issue? In which case, again, this is going to dictate our management strategy here. So these are the things we need to start asking ourselves as we're walking up to a tree that we suspect is chlorotic. And so our management here is going to be a multi-pronged approach here. So it can be, again, pH can be, a, or excuse me, chlorosis can be caused by several different factors. It's not unheard of to have possibly a mite outbreak on a tree as well as having the pH too high, as well as having the sidewalk just put in next to it. Um, so again, you know, our, our management strategy here is going to be a combination of things depending upon our diagnosis and it could be, have to do with site adjustment, doing things to the soil to improve our root regeneration, applying supplemental nutrients, um, and this again will go into our, our diagnosis of what actually is going wrong. Is it abiotic? Is it a pest? Is it a soil deficiency system? So, you know, what can be done about chlorosis? So here's some really some common general guidelines um, for ways that we can improve the health of the tree. So again, keep in mind what chlorosis is, it's, it's simply the plant not being able to produce enough chlorophyll for itself. So ways that we can improve the site are, number one is just simply mulch. And of course, we all know the great benefits of mulch as it helps to regulate soil moisture, helps to regulate soil temperatures. It becomes a food source, if you will, for both macro and microorganisms, which what they'll do is they'll create more available nutrients for the tree, they'll improve the soil through its cation exchange capacity so it can hold more of those nutrients for longer, and also the movement of those animals within the soil, and micro and uh, both micro and macro organisms, will improve our soil structures that will get better penetration for our roots, so those roots can take more advantage of the resources within the soil. And again, mulch, some of the organisms that live within mulch can actually be antagonistic to um, root pathogens, specifically Phytophthora, um, which is just one more great reason to use mulch when we mulch correctly. If we look at just another kind of quick slide here to the great benefits, uh, this here is comparing the use of mulch as a uh, cover around trees to turf. And we can see here the dramatic, you know, we see the picture, of course, and that's dramatic, but here if we dig into the data, the bulk density is almost half so we have, a, again, a, a less compacted soil with more pore space in it, which, again, this will allow more air and water to get to the roots and will allow the roots to develop a lot better. Um, we have more moisture in the soil, which, again, we know that moisture and water is very crucial in many parts of the plant and its, um, its overall health. We have greater root density. We have more mycorrhizal associations. And we also have a, a lower pH, which, again, if we remember our pH chart, um, you know, that ideal range, and many trees also like a little bit of an acidic soil. So being able to influence the overall pH of the soil will allow some of our nutrients to be taken up a lot better. And if you look at this picture here, I mean, this is, this is really um, it in a nutshell, where we have the tree here on our left that was mulched correctly, and the tree here on our right that has, that has not been mulched. Um, and it's just a simple difference right there, uh, simply correctly applying mulch, uh, again, could probably be one of the best things you do in a plant health care program. So again, you know, outside of mulch, if we're dealing with a nutrient deficiency, then many of us are probably very, very familiar with the process of fertilization and, and that. So part of this would again be if we have a, if we take a soil sample and we take leaf samples and we find out exactly what's going on in the soil. This is a great time to just do, if, if it's a simple nutrient deficiency, we come up with a custom blend of um, fertilizer based upon soil analysis. Uh, if we have a pH issue, we try to adjust our pH with some kind of pH conditioner. 
and we go out and we just fertilize the tree, which is, again, very, very straightforward. Um, but again, I want to talk about here prescription fertilization. So, you know, again, walking up to the tree and diagnosing an issue um, just based upon the way the leaves look might lead us down the wrong path. So, again, both potassium and nitrogen are macronutrients, uh, primary macronutrients that show um, chlorosis in older leaves. So finding out is it a nitrogen deficiency or a potassium deficiency is very, very um, crucial. This is also, depending upon your soil, this would also be a good time to put in some of these like biostimulants, if you will, or we can put in beneficial bacteria to help with root growth and fix nitrogen. We can put in that mycorrhizal fungi to help inoculate the tree to help it get more resources out of the soil. So we can add these into our mixes. Um, there are many different uh, lines of products out there where we can do this, these biostimulants, if you will. Um, if we look at our example here, of a, this is a Die Hard and Root Reviver. Um, the different biostimulants, both mycorrhizae, nitrogen that we can put in there. This is also where we can add some other organic material to help improve soil structure and the, it's the soil's ability to hold on to some of these uh, elements that we're putting into the soil. So putting in things like humic acid help us to uh, create better um, cation exchange capacity. Um, adding again some of these amino acids will help the, to encourage the, um, the colonization of that soil by different microorganisms. So these are also things that we can think about when we're going in and doing fertilization to help improve the soil around the tree. Now, let's get into a soil analysis. So we just mentioned soil analysis. So how do you read a soil analysis? Well, there's a pretty common readout of a soil analysis where we're getting an idea of what is happening in our soil. And again, going back to our potassium example, here we can see potassium is low. Potassium often can mimic a nitrogen deficiency. So now we know that you know potassium is probably one of our limiting factors here. And we look through and we see yeah, things are looking pretty good here. Um, but I want to call your attention here to iron. So in our soil sample here, iron is showing up as high, which is really, really good. But now, if the iron is high in the soil, if we have plenty of iron in the soil, why are we still getting deficiency simple symptoms in the leaves? Well, if we take a look here at our pH, we see that our pH is 7.3. If we go back to our chart, remember, this line here was 7.3. If we go up to iron, we can see we are our iron is tied up because of the, um, the soil's pH, because the soil is a little bit more basic than we would like it. Iron is now being held fast to those sites and is unavailable to the tree. So if we came in and ignored this, we would still be getting deficiency symptoms within our plant. So let's address that for a second. Um, because again, it's, it's often that these micronutrients, specifically iron and manganese, are held up in our soils. Um, so what can we do about that? Well, we have these chelated products. And these chelated products, basically the way they work is they, they right here, they form a ring um, of hydrogen bonds around um, a compound. And this is going to counteract the pH, if you will, and make them available um, to the plant. So we have one option there of incorporating chelated products into our standard fertilizer to get that, that product into the tree. Um, that's one way of doing it, which is pretty common. We have spray applications, and this is very, very common, especially in nursery situations, um, you know, also in turf grass situations where we're simply spraying iron onto the plant in this case. Um, again, this is very difficult for large trees. Uh, imagine trying to spray a 70-foot uh, pin oak and trying to get adequate distribution and not make a mess. Um, when you're doing it. So this might not be the most practical thing for large trees. And then finally, we have tree injections uh, of micronutrients. And this is where two of our products come in, verdure and verdure manganese, where we can actually directly inject the micronutrient into the tree and make it available to the plant very, very quickly. And in some cases, available for um, several seasons. So if we take a look at verdure very quickly, so verdure, we have two rates on verdure. We have a spring rate or a summer rate where we can apply it into the tree 
and within about two weeks we'll get green up, which is great. And you'll have green up for that entire season and maybe a little bit into the second season. Now, here's the cool thing about verdure is that if you could hold off and make applications in the fall, you could actually put more iron into the tree. So you can, in the fall, we can inject iron into the tree at a higher rate and we might we can expect to get three to or two to three seasons of green up with verdure, which is really really cool. When you think about that, you come in, you do one stem injection in the fall, and you're getting green up for up to three seasons. This is one of these things that you know tell that to your client. You're not going to have to see me every year. You're going to pay for the service once. Um, this is a great a great little tool for us. And again, we see iron deficiencies in many different species. Uh, pin oak is probably the number one, but you can see here we have a whole host of other species that are pretty common throughout the U.S. Uh, where we get iron deficiencies due to uh, pH tie-up. And of course, the proof's in the pudding. Here we have an example here of trees treated in September of 05, so in the fall of 05. We come back in June of 06 and just look at the differences in those trees. It's, it's night and day. It's pretty incredible. Again, here's some pictures um, from Pennsylvania, where in Pennsylvania we have very, very high pH soils due to our limestone base. Um, we have our untreated tree there on the left and our treated tree there on the right. It's like night and day. Here we have uh, just another example of uh, two years of treatment here where we treated in the fall, year after. So we have, here's our second full season of green or First full season of green up, and here we have our second full season of green up. Again, pretty incredible stuff. For those of us in our subtropical areas, this also works well on many of our subtropical plants. So again, are untreated there on the left and are treated on the right. It's it's, it's incredible. I mean, it's incredible. Um, now again, manganese. Manganese is another issue that we find very often in some of our trees. So in this case here. We can apply in the spring or in the summer, and within one to two months, we can expect to see some green up. But again, if we can hold off into the fall with the onset of fall color, we can inject at a higher rate, and we can get green up for up to two seasons. So again, pretty incredible stuff. And if we look at some of the common issues or common trees that fall into magnesium issues, we have you know our, many of our maple species, birch, dogwoods, things that we find. Um, in many parts of our country with this issue. Uh, here's a neat little study that was put on there by um, Jones and Miller, where in 2008 they had chlorotic red maples that were showing 40% canopy chlorosis. They injected in the fall, and in 2009 we had a candidate that showed zero chlorosis. So again, just great, great results with these stem injected products. Now, there are a lot of stem injected products out there. Um, now, we recommend that you do stem injection with micronutrients through uh, what we could call the old macro system. So our rates are going to be, we want to inject, for every 10 inches of diameter, we want to inject a half a gallon of solution. And the reason for this is because we want to get good, even distribution throughout the tree. If you do something like this in the micro injection units, then you don't have predictable green up throughout the entire tree. Um, due to distribution issues. It's not that you will definitely not get good distribution, it's just you can't get predictable distribution when using micro-injection. So we still recommend that if you're going to do micronutrient injections that you go through the macro-infusion process where you are drilling a little bit more holes than you would with micro-injection and you are injecting more solution into the tree, but you're going to get um, just better results, and especially for those fall applications where you can get three to two to three seasons of, of green up, depending upon the product, um, highly recommend the, the macro injection. Now, there's some other kind of neat things out there that we can use to manage chlorosis um, outside of, of fertilizers and micro injections, and you know these also can all be tied in to one another for a, one large protocol, but the use of growth managers uh, is a really interesting concept when it comes to managing chlorosis. 
Um, you know, we think of course of Canvas Dad, which is our plant growth regulator, which I like, which I like to call a plant growth manager, as uh, slowing down top growth, which it does, and it does very good. It, it does very good in managing the overall growing conditions of the plant. But it does it by um, by altering hormones within the tree. So while it is kind of asking the plant through hormone regulation to not grow, put on as much top growth, it's also doing some other things. So it's asking the plant actually to increase its production in chlorophyll, which it can do because again, it's it's regulating where resources are going within the tree, so we can put more resources into chlorophyll production. And it's also increasing some other hormones, namely the subsistic acid, which works as a plant protection hormone, which helps to stimulate root growth, uh, and also helps with protecting the tree against dehydration and drought symptoms, uh, specifically also through controlling the stomates. So if we look at the increase in chlorophyll, here, you know, with one application of canvastat, and again, this is this will last two to three seasons. Here we have an example of one application of canvastat over the course of three seasons, the difference in the chlorophyll production, so the difference in that green leaf. And again, because we're asking the plant to create more chlorophyll, and we're kind of reallocating the plant's resources away from top growth and into these other things, these other um, growth parts of the plant, this is where we get this increase in chlorophyll. And we can get it for up to three years. Again, we talk about trying to regenerate the root system. We talked about how you know damaged roots, not being able to get resources from the soil, can be involved with chlorosis. Well, with one application of canvastat, we are going to have an increase in fibrous roots. So it's, again, just the tree putting out more roots into the soil to get more resources to help it get the elements it needs to make it healthy and look good. Um, just a real quick picture here, just the, the difference in um, the plants. Here we have untreated on the left and treated on the right, just a compact looking tree, um, definitely greener, no dieback. Um, just uh, again, the proof is in the pictures. Some more pictures of, in this case here, showing off its drought resistance, um, staving off uh, leaf scorch in this case. Uh, we have hot, dry conditions here. Our untreated trees begin to show a lot of scorch due to, again, lack of water. And our treated tree, and you can see where this treated tree is right here by this developed kind of pavilion area, looking great. And that is just through one application of canvas data. And I mentioned what you can do is you can actually combine a lot of these treatments together. So if you're having a high pH soil, you are having, you're lacking macronutrients um, and micronutrients, you could come in, you could fertilize with your, your macronutrients, you could stem inject with your micronutrients, and then you could apply Canvastat and get all those great benefits of Canvastat. And it really, I, I think of it as a tree health enhancer because of the way it's working within the plant, helping it increase that root growth and helping it to just create more chlorophyll for itself. So it's just kind of enhancing all your other products that you're putting in um, to solving your plant health problems. Now here's, here's part of the deal here is that, especially if we're dealing with soil issues, either root development issues or lack of soil nutrients or an issue with soil pH, we, what we really need to do to get to the root of the problem, if you will, is we need to solve those issues. So if we apply one of our Verdurp products, and we apply Canvastat, we're going to get effects from those, again, depending upon when we're applying, we're going to get effects of, the, of those products for two to three years. So if you apply Verdure, uh, let's take this example, if we have a pin oak and it has iron chlorosis um, due to high pH soils and the fact that they put in a new driveway next to it, we can apply Verdure in the fall and that will give us three seasons of available um, iron. We can apply Canvastat to help it slow down its growth, reallocate its resources to have a healthier plant, and we're going to get those effects for two to three seasons. Now, in those two to three seasons, now what we can do is we can start affecting the area around the tree. So after we have broken our, our, um, our iron availability and we have broken out of our growth regulation, we have a site that the tree can really grow in and grow in sustainably. And this is what we can call our process of root enhancement. So root enhancement is a series of steps where we are going to take our compacted damaged soils and we're going to use an air spade and we're going to expand them, create a new soil that has that's no longer compacted and has both available micro and macro pore space 
for the roots to invade and take advantage of. We're going to combine that with a soil analysis. So again, we're going to take a soil analysis, we're going to see what's available in the soil, we're going to figure out what our soil pH is, and we're going to apply um, what we need to the soil to get it to where that plant can thrive and survive. We're going to add this, in this process too, we're going to take um, properly composted organic material, and we're going to mix this into our new soil substrate. So we're going to decompact the soil, we're going to add organic material to the soil, which is going to help with, um, again, so it won't recompact. It's also going to help build that soil structure and create an environment for, again, our micro and macro organisms to live in. We can apply Camistat at this time, too, to get those secondary growth benefits of the Camistat. And once we get this, we start getting a tree that is growing in a very awesome, sustainable environment. So the process of root enhancement begins like this. I just kind of went over it real quickly. But we're going to start by decompacting a predetermined diameter around the tree to a depth of 8 to 12 inches. And again, ideally, we would decompact as much soil volume as possible. And this is what I try to stress with people is it's really about soil volume. So you know, if, if we have some kind of obstruction on the left side of the plant, but we can go a little bit further on the right side of the plant, go as far as you can, get as much soil volume as possible and do your decompaction treatments. So we're going to come up, again, we're going to determine where our site's going to be, where our new site's going to be. We're going to decompact in that area with an air spade. From there, we're going to cover this newly decompacted area with about two inches of, again, properly composted organic material. And again, I can't stress enough, it's, it needs to be properly composted organic material, high quality organic material. If not, then you're going to kind of mess around with the carbon nitrogen ratio. You might actually tie up nitrogen in the soil for, um, for a period of time. This is also where we're going to, again, refer to our soil analysis. We're going to add the elements that the plant needs uh, into the soil, and we're also going to do any kind of soil conditioning at this point. Um, we could also add our biostimulants here, where we're, again, adding maybe amino acids. We can be adding our beneficial bacteria, our mycorrhizae, depending upon the species of the plant, and other things to help improve that cation exchange capacity and, again, create an environment where our soil microorganisms can thrive and continue to build good soil for our trees. So once we've put down all those amendments, we're going to stir it back in. We're going to, again, this is after we get it all stirred back in, we can apply our canvas staff for all the great secondary growth benefits that it can provide for us. We're going to water that. We're going to mulch, um, again, a properly uh, mulch two, four inches, leaving space away from the root flare. Again, we don't want to cover up that root flare with mulch. We want to make sure that is free, free and still out in the air. We're going to properly mulch, and we're going to water that. And then this is what we end up with, is this, this new area around the tree where roots can take advantage of all of the great new resources that we've added to the soil. And we do it hopefully in a way that we have created a, a new sustainable environment where we're going to get the constant nutrient cycling based upon the fact that we have organic matter reapplied in the soil, we have mulch which can then break down and keep on re-energizing that soil, and we've added our, our beneficial um, organisms that will just, again, kind of keep that cycle going. So trying to create a sustainable site um, outside of our initial treatments of fertilization, stem injection, and growth management tools. So to sum it up, chlorosis is caused by multiple effects, and it's really going to take some investigation sometimes into seeing what the cause of our chlorosis is. Um, you know, again, many people, uh, many experienced people might just want to go out there initially and say, oh, we just need to fertilize, but you really need to dig in and see, see what is going on with our chlorosis. And again, our goal here is long-term sustainability. You know, it, it's, it sounds great to be able to go out there every year and do something, but really what we want to do is we want to be able to impact that tree so that we can have a happy tree over a long period of time. And of course, this will also make our clients happy because we won't feel like that we're coming out and doing the same thing over and over again. Um, depending upon the issues, chlorosis can be solved very quickly, but again, achieving long-term stability might take some time. Um, again, buffering pH can, can be an issue. It can take some time to get some of those pH adjustments right, and also that can be something we might need to reapply every few years. So that's something we need to keep in mind when we start coming up with a plan for managing chlorosis. 
And then finally, from a sales standpoint, though, Florist is very easy to show clients, and it might often be the reason why we're being called out to the site in the first place. Why is my tree sick? Why does my tree look like this? Um, if you're just starting to get into plant health care, or you're looking to diversify your plant health care service, this is just, it's an easy foot in the door. Hey, I noticed your tree is looking a little yellow. Let's take a look at it and see what we can do to make it healthy. Some other things that we can offer for you, or we have a host of sales tools that you know we make available to you, our clients. So whether it be marketing material to explain you know, the benefits of growth managers, explain the benefits of stem injected micronutrients, or just simply getting information to your clients about you know, what is chlorosis. These are things that we have here prepackaged for you and are more than happy to share with you to help you in your business. We do have one more webinar coming up in our fall tree healthcare webinar. So there on the 12th of August, you can listen to Sean Burnick talk about late season insect management. Um, it's a really good program. I think you guys would all really enjoy that. And again, you can sign up there at our website at treecarescience.com slash events. One more thing I want to add to is our saluting branches campaign, which is really fast coming up here. So for those of you who have not heard about saluting branches on September 23rd, we are going to be uh, organizing an event where we are going to be doing volunteer tree work and landscape maintenance to 22 veteran cemeteries all over the country. It is going to be an incredible day. It's going to be a day of service. We're going to really help out some of these cemeteries that haven't been getting the love that they need and deserve. Um, and again, we have 22 cemeteries throughout the country. I would highly, highly recommend you go to salutingbranches.org, learn about it. We still are looking for volunteers, we're looking for site leaders, and we're looking for sponsors. And there's a lot of cool things going on around Saluting Branches as well. Um, so look into that. It's going to be a fun day, September 23rd. We're going to do a lot of good stuff. And with that, that concludes all my, my the talking part of me in this, um, this conversation here today. So this is where if you guys have any questions, please feel free to type them into that question box. Um, I'll stay here on the line and uh, answer anything that comes in here for the next few minutes or so. Um, again, please feel free to contact me with any questions at any time. Uh, you see my information is right there on the screen. Uh, please feel free to visit our website at treecarescience.com where you can find all kinds of information on protocols, um, again, diagnostics, as well as, of course, our products. And of course, you always have that 1-800 number there, what we call our solution center, where at any time you can call in, um, talk to actually a real human being on the other end of the phone, and they can help you with anything from pricing to recommendations on dosing to, again, more in-depth questions on what is this, um, you know, what can I do about this. So again, we'll stand in line here just for a few more minutes. Thank you so much for uh, attending here today. and. Um, you guys have a good rest of your week. All right, well, it's been a moment or so. There's no questions, which is awesome. Uh, feel free to contact me or, again, uh, Info Tree Care Science at any time, our Solutions Center. I'm going to conclude the webinar for right now. And, again, just uh, thank you for joining us, and have a good rest of your week. Bye.